Today, we get to talk about one of my very favorite topics, believe it or not. And, well, that might say more about me than the topic, I guess. But today we're going to talk about databases. And I, I, I teach a section of the class a little differently than I used to. I don't know why that matters to you. It probably doesn't. But the, the approach we're going to take is I used to do like a fairly long database review and then we'd get into the ASP.NET stuff. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to do a little bit of database, a little bit of ASP.NET stuff. So the review will not be as concentrated, so we won't have like two or three class sessions that are strictly review, but then we will get into it. Uh, it'll cover a longer span of time because we'll be doing that mixed in with some ASP.NET stuff. I, I think that's a better way to go. I don't know. We'll see. Um, tell me anything you know about databases. Store things. Databases store things. Specifically, what kind of things? Data. 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 Um, what is the difference in, 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 in the way that IT people would refer to the different, now in, in general, conversation, it, it sometimes the, these terms are used interchangeably, but IT people would talk about the difference between data and information. What's the difference between the two? Uh, An IT person says data versus information. What, what do you think the difference means? Pardon me? Data is a piece of information. Data is, is a piece of information. I, I kind of like that. I kind of think, think that's a good start. Data is what you collect from the users and the information is what you retrieve from the data? Um, yes. That, 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 that is, is definitely moving in the, in, in the right direction. Think of data as being ingredients. And information being the... There's no E in it. This is a case where both ways looks wrong to me, but I think that's the right way. Yeah, that's right. I think of data as being the ingredients and information being something usable. All right, yeah. So, you know, eggs, flour, sugar, those are the ingredients. Cake would be, and that those would be the data. Information would be that. Now, again, the, the, the idea is, is that data doesn't magically turn uh, itself into information any more than eggs, flour, and sugar magically turn themselves into cake, right? You wish, right? Everyone would wish for that, right? But the idea is, is that we need a way of recording that data, all right, storing it, um, making sure the data is good can't make a good cake with bad eggs. Boy, that, that sounds like one of them great like old-fashioned folk sayings or something. You know, I should like, I should like, like needle point that onto a, a thing and hang it in the classroom. You can't make a good cake with bad eggs, right? You can't get, come to good uh, information from bad data, all right? <coughs> the key thing is it's usable. Uh, another uh, good businessy buzzword, since business people love buzz buzzwords, is that it's actionable, which simply means you can do something with it. You can take action with it. And an example I gave is, let's say I said a company, their sales for the month of September were seventy thousand dollars. All right, company X Y Z. I'm not telling you who they are yet. And their sales were $70,000 for September. What do you think about that? Is that good? Is it bad? Should their sales manager get a raise? Should their sales manager get fired? <laughs> exactly. Who knows? Who knows? Because if their sales were $70,000 for a month, and this was some... Uh, I got a guy.
guy that lives around uh, uh, in my neighborhood called the stump guy, whose job is pulling stumps out. If he did $70,000 $70, of stump pulling in a month, I'm thinking he had a great month. All right, I'm thinking he's retiring to the Bahamas, you know, in a couple months, right? On the other hand, if Ford Motor Company only sold $70,000 worth of cars in a month, well, then people would be losing their jobs. They'd be fired. It would be horrible. All right? So what, did we, what do we need to put that data, that one piece of data, $70,000 sales, into context and make it something usable. What do we need to do that? Well, we need to transform it into information, and how would we do that? All right, more data. And that's true. But what are we going to do with that data? We're going to analyze it. And what does analyzing compare uh, to do? I, I'm giving out my <laughs> I'm giving out my answer. What what, what would analyze, ana, analyzing it consist of? I want to say consist of. I think and I said compare. Well, one thing you do is you compare, right? You compare with what they did in previous months would be one way to, to analyze this and say, well, if they did fifty thousand dollars worth of sales, fifty thousand dollars worth of sales, fifty thousand dollars worth of sales, seventy thousand dollars worth of sales. They did some right. They had a good month. All right. So hey, keep doing that. Do more of it. Whatever. All right. On the other hand, if they had a hundred thousand dollars sales, a hundred thousand dollars sales, a hundred thousand dollars sales, and then seventy thousand dollars, then you look and say, well, okay, um, what went wrong? What what do we need to do to get that back up again? So, more data, but not just lumping more data on it, the an, you know, analyzing it. And that will involve like comparing things, comparing current data with historical data, comparing data with other things, for example, expenses. If you sold $70,000 and you had $50,000 worth of expenses, that's great. If you sold $70,000 but you had $200,000 worth of expenses, that's not so great. So all these things put and taken and put together allows you to take and um, transform this data into something that you can actually do something with. All right. Um, summarizing data sometimes is useful. All right. If I had a list of this seventy thousand dollars of all the sales that that company made during the month. That list, you know, if it's if it's let's let's say it's it's something, um, if it's a pizza place and it is seventy thousand dollars worth of pizza, which I'm thinking is a lot of pizza, but I guess I don't know. Um, it wouldn't do any good to see every single order for that month, right? That doesn't really matter. What matters is to summarize it. All right. So we do things like summarize, combine things compare things, perform mathematical operations on things. So for example, subtract the expenses from the sales to get um, gross margin or, or whatever uh, that's called in accounting. So the idea is, is it's not just more data, but it's more data and then looking critically at it some way or another by comparing it, analyzing it, summarizing it, looking for exceptions, for example. How could you look, let, let's, let's assume that this is a nationwide company and they did $70,000 70, worth of sales across the nation, all right? And let's say that's down from $100,000. What might you want to look at to see how to fix that? That relates to exceptions. Pardon me? Yeah, was there any special circumstances? You know, was, you know, was the general economy, you know, did the price of gas go up by a certain amount? So, you know, maybe that caused, you know, uh, lower sales for the month. What might be something else that you'd look at? Well, if you went from $100,000 to 
$70,000. Maybe you look at it, if it's a nationwide company, maybe you look at it by like region or by branch office or something like that. Did every one of them have a 30% drop? Or did most of them stay the same, but one region had a 30% drop? All right? Or did a couple regions have a drop? Or did some regions even go up? Right? Because, you know, I wouldn't want to go and yell at the sales manager in every one of my regions if three of my four regions were actually doing better and one of them was doing a lot worse. I'll go yell at the person <laughs> that is uh, managing the, the one that's not doing so well, right? Or, or again, in, in a more realistic sense, I'd look into what could potentially be the cause of that. Again, getting back to your thing, maybe it's an area where there was like a hurricane or, or whatever, or there's something special about that area that, that caused the decline or whatever. So again, it's not all about just yelling and whatever, but it's seeing what we can do to fix it, right? Because a drop in that, you know, you wouldn't want everyone to change their ways of doing business, right? Because these, these three regions are doing it right. Keep it up. You know, hey, I ain't got nothing to tell you. You're doing great. Just keep up the good work. This is the one that you'd look to analyze. So another way would be what's called like exception or management by exception. So you don't look at necessarily every thing that happened. You look for the things that stand out that are exceptional. And again, sales is like one of the easiest ways to think of this, you know, because that, that's pretty intuitive. But another way to do it would be, let's say we had a help desk, all right? And we were managing our help desk, and we found that our customer satisfaction had gone down. Let's say our customer satisfaction out of 10 was a 6. Should we, we be happy with the six? I don't know. Um, six is better than a four, but it's not as good as a seven, eight, or nine. I guess I generally wouldn't be too happy if our, our score was a six. Now, on the other hand, if it had gone from four to six versus eight to six, that would be two different scenarios that you'd investigate. I would also look at, though, exceptions. In other words, I might look at, um, I might try to correlate, and again, correlate involves combining or, or, or linking pieces of data together to see, like, is there a correlation between the average time to resolve a problem and the customer satisfaction? Or the number of times that they have to speak to a customer service representative before they have their problem solved? Or how long from the time they originally reported it till the time that it finally got resolved? Or were there cases of people calling back for the same problem over and over and over again, right? We actually, uh, at, at uh, one of our meetings yesterday, we, someone was talking about a previous job they had, whereas um, their computer was overheating and bad things were happening. So, you know, the technician would come in restart it, of course it's not overheated then, right, when it's just restarted. So it's like, yep, yep, it's solved. It's not, re it's not overheating now. Well, yeah, of course it's not going to overheat within the first 30 seconds unless it's on fire or something, right? So therefore, the frustration came in for the fact that the technician was saying it was done and solved before, and so they had to call, keep calling their help desk for the same problem over and over and over again. So those are all different causes of the problem, you know, uh, of, the, of, the, of the satisfaction, customer satisfaction going down. Maybe it's taking too long to get a solution. Maybe people, maybe customer service people are telling people that the problem solved when it's not and they keep calling back for the same problem. Maybe it's taking too long for the initial content. Maybe it's taking too long for follow-up. All these things are buried somewhere in the data if you look closely and you analyze it, all right? Now, what databases allow are for that very 
flexibility. All right. So yes, data bases store data. And they store data in a flexible manner. Because that flexibility allows us a better opportunity to turn that data into information. Now I will say, if you like go out on YouTube, my database videos are like the star of my video library out there. I get more views on those. those probably because those are like among the first ones I put out. But like if you go to YouTube and search for database, there's a good chance of my name will be listed, uh, my videos will be listed among the, the first few. All right. But one person mentioned, oh, one of the comments, and he made a good point, that data to information isn't enough. All right. That the next step is wisdom or understanding. All right. To which I reply, that's not the job of IT people. <laughs> we take you this far. And then it's up to managers to have the insight to know what that means and what they can do with it. And to ask for the right data. All right, or right information, I should say. So that's true. Data can lead to information. Information then can lead to insight or understanding or, or wisdom. So couple things that I talked about as far as transforming data into information. Number one is the more flexible you can be, the better job you can do at it. Right? So think back to the help desk example. All right? It means one thing if I can just see the uh, customer satisfaction. It means another thing is that I can break that down by kind of problem, maybe. Um, correlate the customer satisfaction with the calls that that customer made. Um, see the duration, how long it took to resolve the customer's calls, and see if there's a correlation between that and their satisfaction. See how many times the customer called about the same problem, and see if there's a correlation there. The more flexible I can be in this, the better information I can, can uh, glean. The other thing to remember is that can't make good cake with bad eggs, all right? And therefore, the quality of the data is key, all right? Um, one of the oldest IT acronyms is garbage in, garbage out, all right? It is interesting, over time, when I was younger, um, folks called what we do in uh, uh, data processing. To talk about data processing uh, or EDP, electronic data processing. Now you hear people talk about information technology. And I think that is, um, as the field matured, that shows that, the, under, that, that, that the, the, the benefit of doing this isn't simply gathering the data. All right? The benefit of it is gathering data that can be taken and transformed into a way that is useful. So, the question then becomes, how do we make data that's accurate, and how do we make data that is flexible in how it can be presented? Any ideas there? You store it well. Exactly. You store it in the optimal way. All right? Let's talk about a non-optimal way to do this, all right? Let's say we had spreadsheets for our call center, all right? And I had one spreadsheet that showed problems by product, all right? We, my, my hypothetical company sells a bunch of products, and so we had one spreadsheet that showed organized by product the problems. All right. I had a different spreadsheet that another person keyed into that was by customer. All right. I had a third spreadsheet that was by call. That is, every time the customer called in and there was a conversation, you would keep track of that. What's the 
problem with that sort of approach? Why is that not a good way to store it? Pardon me? It's too many places to store the data, and what is that going to lead to? Disorganization. Disorganization. Inaccurate data. Pardon me? Inaccurate data. Inaccurate data, and then you said duplication. And what? And how would that happen? Both of you guys are kind of saying the same thing. If you updated your data, like say in sales, it may not go to the Exactly. If you updated it in one place, if you updated it by product, you may the person is, who's responsible for updating it by customer may not have done it. So if you have one report that you get by product, it might not add up to the report by customer simply because it's that. And duplicate data is bad because first of all, it lends itself to be inconsistent, and secondly, it's duplicate. It's not adding value. It's, it's simply more effort to do the same thing. All right. So, by storing things in their own little silos, own spreadsheets, we do a couple things. First of all, we likely to have duplicate or redundant data. So one of the goals of databases is to remove redundant data. I should put remove in front of this, because otherwise it would say one of the goals of databases is, to, to, is redundant data. No, it's to remove redundant data. A second problem, and a little bit less obvious problem than, what, uh, than the duplicated data, is it's hard to sort of cross-correlate then if you have things in their own silos. What about if I want a little bit of information from this spreadsheet and a little bit of information from this spreadsheet and a little bit of information from this spreadsheet? I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's difficult because it would take a person to go and figure out how to link all that stuff together. All right? So, by having things in their own silos, and these are sequential files or flat files would be essentially a spreadsheet, all right? What you have is you have an inflexible design. All right. We want a flexible design. All right. So we don't want things stored in a rigid format. We want things stored in a fluid format, whereas it can be combined in a bunch of different ways. Now, when we talk about combining things, we're saying that there are relationships between different pieces of data. All right. So, for example, if we find that our customer satisfaction went down, we might look to see, you know, was it for every customer or is it just for certain certain customers? And we might see, well, there's there's a few customers that that really became much less satisfied for us. One thing we might look at is what for those customers? The satisfaction. Yeah, let's say their satisfaction went down. What, what might we look for those customers? What went wrong? Okay. A little more specific, maybe? What was the problem? What was the problem? What products they have? Things of that nature. We would want to link a customer then to their specific problems, their specific calls, their specific products, and so on, and we could do some analyzation that way. All right? We can't do that if the data isn't linked together. The data is in its own little separate silos. Or, again, a better way to put it isn't necessarily that we can't do that. It would be difficult to do that. So when I talk about being able to present the data in a flexible way, what I'm talking about is having data in a way that it can be combined in a variety of different ways. And when I talk about combining data, I'm implying that there are relationships between the data. Last but not least, we want to make sure that data is accurate.
to a greater degree as possible. Now, we want to make sure it's accurate insofar as it's correct, right? Of course, nothing can eliminate all inaccuracies, right? Because, you know, if human beings are logging a call, they could possibly enter in the wrong information. There's nothing we can do on a database level to prevent people from entering in that instead of customer 123, it was customer 132 or something like that. All right? However, we can make sure the data has integrity. All right? And integrity is a little bit different than accuracy. But integrity means the data is consistent. All right? So, if there's a field for customer number, make sure that there's a valid customer number in it. You know, if our customers are customers 1 through 300, you shouldn't be able to enter in that they're that customer number 900 called in, right? Because that's not a valid customer, all right? That's what I mean by integrity. Or if a value is supposed to be numeric, then it is numeric, all right? Spreadsheet, right? You could enter anything in. You know, you could say it's numeric, but you could enter in a string or a date or something like that. Whereas, we can ensure with the database that it has integrity. It might be the wrong value, all right? It might be the wrong date, for example, but at least we know it's a date. It's not something else. So, that's a little bit different than accuracy. Now, there's some things we can do to help accuracy even on a software level, but... On a database uh, design level, what we're really interested in is integrity. Okay, so there's, there's essentially our goals. We might even be able to summarize that a little bit more, but we'll, we'll stop here. So how do we achieve those goals in databases? How do we eliminate redundant data in databases? We organize it. And how do we organize the data? We store it in the right table. Exactly. We store it in the right table. First of all, there's a notion of a table. All right? We eliminate redundant data by storing things in tables. All right? So in other words, in the spreadsheet example that I gave, there could be customer information in the one in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the spreadsheet that's organized by product, in the spreadsheet that's organized by call, in the spreadsheet that's organized by customer, all of them could contain pieces of customer information. Right? Well, that's not a good way to do it because, again, that leads, leads to redundancy and inconsistency and inaccuracy and lack of integrity. So instead, we're going to put everything about an entity in one place. And that place is called the table. So, in this example, we would have a customer table. Alright? So we have a customer table. Everything about a customer is in that table. Alright? So we don't have to worry about the customer name being in several places, right? In the call spreadsheet, in the product spreadsheet, in the customer spreadsheet, and so on. We don't have to worry about that. In the rating spreadsheet, because it's only in one place. It's only in that table. Which means it might be wrong, but it's wrong in a consistent manner, right? If um, someone has me in as Mike... Um, Mike Fellers, all right, instead of Zellers, it'll be wrong throughout the system. It'll be wrong in a very consistent way. So you can't guarantee accuracy, but you can guarantee integrity and consistency. So the good news is, is if it's wrong, it's wrong everywhere. Or, I'm sorry, the bad news is if it's wrong, it's wrong everywhere. <laughs> the good news is when you correct it, you also correct it everywhere. So if you corrected my name, then boom, every place would happen. What is in this table? Okay, customer ID is one example of something that's in this table. What are these things that are in this table called? Identifiers. Well, that's an identifier, but I think you, you used the term columns a few minutes ago. Right, the table consists of 
a group of columns. And it's all the columns about that entity. So everything is relevant to the problem that you're trying to solve. So customer ID would be one of the fields. The customer name, the address, city, state, zip, phone, email. Credit card number, maybe, maybe not. All right. Some places say we don't store your credit card number. That way, there's no chance of getting hacked. All right. So maybe, or maybe they will allow you to store multiple credit cards and pick which one you want to use. So that would be a different issue. Let's leave credit cards out of this. All right. For both those reasons. All right. Okay. Each of these is called columns or sometimes called attributes. You know, they're characteristics, you know. They're characteristics of a customer. What does a customer have? Well, a customer has a name. Of course they do. They have an address. They have a phone number, email address, and so on. All right? Now, what's special about the customer ID? It's unique. It's unique. It's unique in the actual sense of the word unique. You know. It's unique for that company and that table. It's unique for that table, right. And what, what unique means is that there's nothing, that has, nothing else that has the same value. Like, you could say, wow, he's a unique individual. He wears purple shoes. Well, no. Unless he's the only person on earth that wears purple shoes, you can't say that that person's unique for wearing purple shoes, all right? So in general conversation, people use the word unique to mean rare, all right? But in database terms, when we say something is unique, we mean that there's only one that has that value, all right? Why is it, why is it important that there's only one customer with a customer, a certain value for a customer ID? Why is that important? Association, so we don't get them mixed up. Exactly. So we have a bill for customer number one, two, three. Where do we mail it to? Well, if there were two customer one, two, threes, I don't know. Who would you mail it to? Probably both, right? See, maybe you have both of them to pay. I don't know. Doesn't sound like a good business practice to me. All right. It needs to be unique because we're going to use this to relate every other table to the customer table. So anything that's connected to a customer is going to be linked only by the customer ID. Why wouldn't the name work? Two people who have the same name, right? Um, you know, John Smith. There could be a couple of John Smiths of your customer. Again, what would you do? What's another characteristic of a primary key? This is called a primary key, by the way. It's an identifier. What's another characteristic of a primary key? Let me ask you this. How many of you in this room have a student ID number? Everyone does. If someone doesn't, I'm going to go call, you know, call security and have you removed, right? Because you have to have a student ID number to be a student. All right? So, in addition to be unique, it's required. You cannot have a customer without a customer ID. And again, if you think about the reason that we're going to do this for relating one thing to another, that makes sense, right? Because if you had a customer without a customer ID, how would you point to him to say this bill belongs to him? You'd have a bill without a customer too? Well, how would that work? Again, it, it wouldn't. So therefore, Every customer needs to have a customer ID. 
So, in using precise terminology, this is called a table. When we're designing databases, we will call this an entity. All right? We sort of transform it. Entity is the more conceptual term. Table is the more concrete is in the database. These, when we're designing, we'll call them attributes. But when we put them in the database, they'll be columns. And this is a primary key. All right? Now, we can specify some properties for each of these. We can say, for example, which are required and which are not. We can specify data types, all right, that, you know, this is, you know, that this is numeric, that this is alphabetic, and so on down the line, all right. Maybe the birth date is there. That has to be a date. We can specify whether it's required or not, you know. Maybe someone doesn't have a phone. Does that mean we don't want to take money from them? Of course not, all right. So therefore, phone, well, that might not be a required field. Name and address, yeah, that's probably a required field. We need to know who to send the bill to, all right? And so on down the line. Maybe birth date, we want for marketing reasons. We want to know um, our demographics of, like, how old people are that use our products, all right? Um, but maybe we don't require it. Yeah, if you don't want to give your birth date, that's okay. Because, you know, for some people that would be, um, you know, they would consider that a private thing that they wouldn't want to share. So, table, columns, primary key. All right. There's also some fancy database terms like tuples and I don't even know what those mean. So, if you see those, just ignore them. <laughs> All right. So, it's about as much fun as we can have with one table. Right. Uh, if you're just talking about one table, you're not really talking about a database. You, you might as well do it in a spreadsheet. But you know you're not going to be talking about just one table. You're going to have a second table. And that table is going to be um, related to the other tables. And pretty much, as a general rule, tables will sort of form a chain. It's very rare to have a table in your database that is not related to anything else just kind of doesn't make sense to do that. Not saying it's impossible, but it is kind of rare. All right? So let's, let's have, let's create a second table. Support call. So this is when a customer calls in and needs help with something. All right? What are some attributes that we would want to have in this table? We would want to first and foremost have the customer ID. All right, Let, let's just, we'll identify and then we'll talk about them more. What else might, would we want to have in this table? What the issue is? Yeah, um, some statement of the problem. And right now, we'll just make that a text field, all right? We're going to start small, and then we could expand this, you know, as we go on. But for now, we'll just say, like, a description of the problem. Pardon me? Probably have a call ID, so you know which call it was. Okay. Maybe a call ID. Okay. What else would we want? The length of the call. The length of the call. The length of the call? Date and time of the call. Person who took the call. All right. Person who took the call. Right. We're we're going to start out. Some of these things we're just going to be vague about, and then later on we'll come in and fill in the the, the blanks. Right now I want to do stuff with these two tables, and we'll come in and we'll sort of expand it in subsequent classes. Yes? You say if it was resolved or not. Whether it was resolved or not. And then finally, maybe what the solution was. Of course, that we could hard code, right? Because what's the solution to every technical problem? Turn it off and turn it back on, right? So, 
that, that we don't even, we can just hard code that in it. No, 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 just kidding. All right. It is amazing how often that works out. And believe me, I work technical support. And I'll tell you, here's a technical support dirty trick. All right. Uh, we were shorthanded on technical support at a company that I worked at. So they had us developers work the, the, the call line. All right. And let me tell you, that is not fun and programmers did not enjoy that at all. So we went kicking and screaming to this, but eventually we did it. So we worked short, you know, we worked maybe, we just kind of filled in, you know, an hour here, hour there. So let me, so guess what? If someone called in with a problem at 10.59 and my shift ended at 11, guess what I'm going to tell them? Reboot it and call back. <laughs> All right. Why would I do that? Well, because in the me in the intermediary time, boom, it's eleven. I'm done. And then when they call back, I'm not proud of saying this. All right. <laughs> if I had it over to, to to do again, I, I probably would do the same. But uh, I would I would feel a lot more guilty with it. The other the other good strategy, by the way, and, and again, this is. Uh, uh, this is a good one. If there's a customer you didn't want to talk to, you'd call them when you thought they were going to be out at lunch. All right. So, like, like we, my, our helpline was like in a corporate environment. So we, we weren't helping like consumers. We were helping other companies. So like, you look, it's like hmm, that customer's in Dallas. What is Dallas? Dallas is what two hours behind us. So. Let's see, that would mean like if I call them back at 2 o'clock, that would be noon their time. Yeah, we'll call it 2.15. <laughs> they should be going to lunch by then. So those are my two top customer support dirty tricks. All right. Um, and the amazing thing is, is my 10.59 trick would work a lot of times. And people would call back and say, boy, that guy was brilliant. He, uh, you know, he solved my problem in two seconds, you know. And it's like, well, yeah, you know, I, I, I do my best. All right, anyhow, so we'll go with this now, all right? You mentioned a call ID. What is the purpose of a call ID? Why do you need that? each call All right, again, sort of the same reason for the customer ID. We might want to associate something to this call because maybe there's callbacks or maybe there are parts needed. You know, maybe someone calls in with a problem and the solution is to send them a new part. Well, we might link parts to this support call or something like that. So in order to link, we need some kind of ID. We need something that uniquely identifies it. And it will often be simply an ID number. Now, the call ID is probably just going to be just a sequential number. The first call that we, we had when we went live is call number one. The second call is call number two and so on. Because that number doesn't really mean anything. It just needs to be there so that um, it can be linked to or identified to. Now, we could use other things to identify. We wouldn't have to use a call number. What else in here could we use to identify a call. Customer ID. Customer ID? Well, no, that would mean a customer only has, could have one problem. The ID and date and time? Maybe. Well, well, maybe if you were talking about customers being like individuals. All right? So, like, if you were talking about customers as individuals, yes, the same point in time, that same person should not be calling two calls, phone in each ear, to the support line. So that would be okay. What if you're talking about the customers being another corporation, though? Well, if you're, if you're uh, again, thinking back of the company I worked for, which sold software to businesses, it could be that person in one department was calling in with a problem, person in another department was calling with a different problem. Well, what are the odds that they would call at the exact same time? Uh, we don't want to play dice with that, right? If you, even if something isn't very likely, all right, 
you don't want to assume that it can't happen or it will never happen. If it's possible, over time, it very well could happen. And it very well could be just at a coincidence. You got hit right at the same time, same customer called in. Now, we could refine that to say, okay, that's true, but they'd probably be talking to other people at our company. So we could maybe say customer ID, person, date and time would be a good primary key. And probably that would be good. But you know what? Why, why worry about that? Just generate a number. And then you know that's going to be unique. You know you're not going to run out of numbers. All right? So that's a good candidate for a primary key. All right? Questions about any of these things? Some of these things are going to eventually, as we expand this example, relate to other tables. All right? So call ID, date, time, person, that could link to another table. Problem could link to another table. Uh, length of time probably would be like a number. Resolved or not would probably be a Boolean. The solution could be related to another table, or there could be a description, and the customer ID is definitely going to relate to another table. Now, if you think about this already, we could see how we would, um, how we could use this to uh, combine and filter stuff out. What are some information that we could get just from these two small tables? Yeah, we can see who's calling us the most. Maybe the problem is training, right? Like, we notice that. Like, if we, so we sold software, we also sold training for our software. So, uh, or we even provided some training for free, right? It might, if, if the same customer is calling in over and over and over, it might be better for us to send someone to do a one-day training session with them so that they learn how to use our software than to take support calls, take 10 support calls a day from them for the rest of the year, all right? So that would be one thing that we could have. Another thing we could, we could look at is see how many of our problems were resolved in a given day and how many were left open, right? If the problem was resolved, then, well, at this point, we're going to assume that it was actually resolved, it was taken care of. So. If there are 100 calls coming into our call center and all 100 of them got solved, hey, the call center's doing a good job. If, however, there are, you know, 10%, 20%, you could, tr as a manager, you could track that number and you'd probably have in your mind a, a value that you didn't want that to go over. You know, at the end of every day, you want maybe 85% of your calls to be resolved. So you could manage that way. So even with something simple like this, we could look at the data in a couple different ways and come up with some sorts of conclusions and take some action on those conclusions. All right. Now, the customer ID in this table points to the customer ID here. In other words, if... We have customer one, two, three, Bob Jones, and Bob calls in, let's say he's the first person that calls, today we're going to have a value of one, two, three here because that's Bob Jones's customer ID. What is this field called? There's a specific name for this field. This is a foreign key, right? A foreign key is another table's primary key. A foreign key points to another field, another table's primary key. <laughs> There's some requirements for it to be a foreign key, though. In other words, I can't simply define a customer ID here and a customer ID here, and boom, I have a foreign key. I have to make it a foreign key and say, you're a foreign key. All right? 
What does that mean when I define something as a foreign key? It makes a relationship. It makes a relationship. What are the restrictions on it then? Well, it has to exist in, in another table. It has to exist in that other table. So for example, let's say I had customer numbers that started off at 100 and it went up to 750. And I just sequentially, uh, you know, just as new customer came on board, they got added to the list. The next one would be 751 and so on. If these are my customer IDs, the database would not allow me to put in a call for customer number 900. It wouldn't do it. Database would refuse to do that. It would not allow you to add a call for a customer that didn't exist. All right? Would not allow you to add a call. So this isn't because there's an if statement in the program or anything like that. This is actually a restriction in the database. It doesn't matter what program you use. It doesn't matter what language you use, you know, whether you are going through the database's interface or you have written an interface of your own, that database, if this is defined as a foreign key, simply will not allow you to put in a value here that doesn't match up with a value there. All right? In fact, that's the beauty of relational databases, is these restrictions are built inside the database. All right? They're built inside the database, which means the old saying goes by hook or by crook, you can't force in bad data. Now let's think about the spreadsheet example. If I have a spreadsheet, if I have two spreadsheets, one that has customer information, one that has um, customer um, call information, all right? I could have a very, very, very diligent person that always made sure that the customer number they put in is valid. All right? But guess what? That person could be on vacation and the next person isn't so diligent and messes up and puts in. And all of a sudden you have a call for an invalid customer and you don't know what to do with it. Who do you call back? All right? The other thing that you could do in Excel, because you can do some crazy stuff in Excel. You could write a little macro or thingy or whatever it's called to make sure that if you put in a customer number in this spreadsheet, it matches up with the customer number in this other thing. So you could do that. A couple things. It takes a lot of work to do that. I would imagine it would. I don't know how to do it, but it, I imagine it takes at least a little bit of work. And there's a second problem with that. There could be a third spreadsheet where the person doesn't know how to do that. So spreadsheet two could always link to spreadsheet one, but spreadsheet three might not link to spreadsheet one. So I could build in controls to make sure that this always linked to that, but I would have to implement those controls in every individual little spreadsheet or application that access that data. Well, you know, as they say, a chain's only as strong as its weakest link. And at some point, that process is going to fail. And at that point, your data has lost some integrity because you could put in data that doesn't match up with another table. All right, so, you know, you, your data no longer has integrity. It's different with a database. With a database, the relationships are built into the structure of the database. So everyone that uses the database is subject to those restrictions. You simply can't, if you define it as a foreign key, force in a, um, a value um, in the customer field um, that, that did not match up with the customer in the customer table. Question. Could I put in a call without a customer number. Well, okay. Let, let's let's back up cuz 
because this is sort of a trick question, sort of. I would think that I would want to make sure that every call had a customer. And if it was a new customer, I would put them in the customer table first, and then I would enter in their call. Okay. Um, however, there could be cases where you would have a relationship that might be there, but isn't required. All right. Can anyone think of a relationship that you might have in a database that exists, but wouldn't always be required? Not necessarily this database, but just any database. Pardon me? Like a spouse, possibly. A spouse. That would be that'd be a great example. You could have you could have tables that had people in them, and you could have a spouse relationship. Using the word relationship very literally that way, right? Alright. Not everyone has a spouse. If they do have a spouse, I want to make sure that that spouse is valid in the database. But if they don't have a spouse, that's fine. You know? Can't say, well, gee, you know, you would have to get married before we can put you in this database. It doesn't seem to be good database design. The other thing I was thinking would be uh, like student and major. All right, students can have a major. All right, and if there was a major field for the student in the student table, you certainly would want to make sure that there was a value in there that was correct. You wouldn't want to put in that they're majoring in. Um, you know, playing Magic the Gathering or some some major that doesn't exist. All right. So if there's a if, if they do have a major, it needs to be a valid major. However, there are students that don't have majors. They're undeclared. They don't know what they want to do yet. So you wouldn't necessarily require a major. If it's if it's there, it has to be valid, but it might not have to be there. Now in this particular case, it doesn't make sense for me to have a call without a customer. So but again, that's a database design issue. All right, what I like to do with the last 10 minutes is, number one, remind you that there's no class on Thursday. Okay, so this is an opportunity for you to catch up or start thinking about your project or whatever. Second thing I like to do is I like to build a, a simple access database and um, link to it in ASP.net. I said we'd try to do a little bit of database concepts, a little bit of ASP.net. So let's finish that up. So I'm just going to build a customer table. Why do I use access is always a question I get because it's quick and dirty and the concepts that apply here apply to any relational database. It's just a matter of getting the right connection string. All right. So let's build a blank database. Let's call it call center. And away we go. Gives you one table for free. Yay. For free. <laughs> we're not going to do it this way. We're going to go into design view. And we have to name the table. So I'm going to say customer. Customer ID. That's the first field. This is an auto number field, which simply means that it automatically increments. I don't have to put in a value for it. 
The first row that gets added gets added with a number of one. The second custom, second one added gets a, a number of two, and so on down the line. The little key note notation next to it indicates it's the primary key to that table. So access is sort of uh, has as attended my lectures and sort of knows some of this stuff already, so it nudges you in the right direction. So I'm going to go in. I'm going to put customer name. I'm not paying too close attention to these other things other than data type. You can, for example, require a field. So I'm going to, I'll go in and make this guy required. So you have to have at least a name. Address, I'll allow you to leave blank. City, state, and zip, I'll allow you to leave blank. All right, that's enough. This is, this is boring. <laughs> All right, so let's go and add a couple of customers here. So I'm going to go and close this. Yes, I do want to save it. Now I can double click it and I can go in and I can add customers. Bob Jones, Fred Smith. Um, Mary Johnson, and so on, all right? I just want to put some data in, all right, so we can do the next step. Let's put in a couple cities and states, though. So we have at least a little bit of data about each person. Notice that it created the customer ID for me. Now one thing that some students are alarmed about is that if I go and delete number three, it doesn't reuse that number three. All right, don't worry, you're not gonna run out of numbers. Those numbers are only used to provide a way of linking and therefore the meaning of the numbers don't matter. Now, that being said, in certain tables, missing numbers are important, all right? Can anyone think of a table that you would not want there to be missing values for keys? Product IDs? Product IDs, eh? Maybe, maybe not. Construction IDs? Maybe. What? Like if you had a table that listed... Um, Step one, step two, step three. Okay. If there was some sort of thing where there was a sequence of things, then you would you would possibly want to make sure that. I guess I'm thinking of like financial things, like invoices or check numbers. I mean, that's something they look at when they audit, right, is that your check register has that. So, I mean, if you imagine you add check number 100, 101, 102, then it jumped to 104, and you notice that your head accountant came in in a brand new suit, all right, you'd be a little suspicious. Likewise, if an invoice number was missing, then maybe that invoice was like, you know, uh, if you pay me in cash, I'll record it for you, you know, that sort of thing. So there are cases for that, but on the database level, for tables such as this, it's probably not that critical. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and I'm going to create a little ASP.NET app to simply read that table. Or what I'll do is I'll open up Visual Studio, 
by next Tuesday when we have our next class, it'll be ready and I can go in and finish the job. Yeah. Pardon me? website, put it on the desktop, and I'm going to call it Call Center. Empty website, C Sharp, goes and does its thing. And it makes it. Now I'm going to move my database to be part of that folder. That's important to do because, you know, when you upload it, I have to have everything. I have to have the database and, and your code and all that. So I'm going to go in to, here's my database. Let me put it on the desktop. We're going to call center. And I'm going to make a folder called app data. Now I didn't just make that up. App data is the place to put your databases because there's special security applied to that folder so people can't directly access them. So I'll go in and I'll move my folder in here. Go back to Visual Studio and hit refresh. All right, now it knows about that. Okay, so I'm going to create a new form. New file, web form, default. And let's say I just want to see simple listing of all of my customers. This is similar to what we did with the sitemap, right? With the sitemap and the sitemap path, we had our data, and then we had the visual way that we're presenting it, all right? We had our sitemap XML file, and then we had a tree view that we put that in, or we had a menu view that we put that in, or we had our sitemap path that we put that in. So there's binding between the data. There's a visual representation of it, and then there's a source of the data. There'll be the same thing here. I'm going to go and create a grid view. A grid view is simply a table that contains a grid of data. So we're just going to do like a grid of our customer information. Choose data source. Well, I haven't made any data sources yet, so I'm going to pick new data source. Where does this come from? Well, it's going to come from a database. Database. 
do I have a connection string? I have not defined a connection string yet. Now we'll come back to this on Tuesday, but I only want one, one connection string per application. All right, because if I change where the data is stored, I just want to change it in one place. So I'll click New Connection. It is a Access Database. Where is the file? The file is here. I'm going to save the connection string to a field that I'm cleverly calling connection string. Reason for that again is when I do this again, I don't want to have to recreate this connection string. I want to simply say, hey, use that connection string I used the other day. All right. That way, if the position or even the type of the database changes, I only need to change the connection string. So you can easily switch between a test mode pointing to a test database and a production mode that points to a production database. All right, so now I can specify what columns I want. I'm going to take the easy way out, and I'm going to pick everything from the customer table. So I just check the star. It shows me a list of tables. I only have one. I'm going to pick everything. We're not going to worry about this today. Click Next. I can test my query, finish, and that bound that data source to this visual control. So if I run it, we get data from our database table. If I go in to access, let's assume that, you know, hey, we just made a sale, we have a new customer. Great. Um, Ken from <laughs> Los Angeles. Ken's, Ken's like a, a mover and a shaker. He doesn't have time for last names or anything like that. So Ken from L.A. All right, is a customer. I come back here and refresh the page, and there's Ken. So it's, it's live. Every time I make a request, it runs out. It's dynamic. Every time I make a request, it runs out, retrieves the data, and displays it. Now, I want to take an example all the way through from design to at least some sort of thing. We'll continue with this, but I would encourage you in the meantime to start playing around 